Um, I have to uh, uh, tell you in advance that this project is still underway. Uh, and in fact, you are the first audience with whom I will share its uh, preliminary insights. So it will be very great to hear your comments, your suggestions. Thank you very much for those in advance. Uh, before I uh, go into the actual project, I would like to um, spend a few minutes talking about the um, background of the project and uh, how it fits into other work that I do within my stream of uh, global strategy studies. Um, we believe, at IMSS, we believe that the topic of emerging uh, markets and mid-sized companies from emerging markets has its relevance in the moment because uh, global marketplace is no longer for large companies only. We increasingly see many uh, international players of mid-sized, uh, small size uh, uh, that are entering the uh, global markets and uh, com successfully compete with uh, other players. So um, from this point of view, it, it, we see the value of studying the experience of such companies because so far the modern mainstream management theory, management practices, they are largely confined to the experience of Western M&As on the global marketplace. Um, in terms of the companies which we study, they have a number of characteristics. They are mid-size. They are not state-run or state-owned. They are not from resource-based industries, which is particularly important for Russia. Um, they are globally competitive. They are entrepreneurial by their spirit, by the way they continuously renovate themselves. And they are innovative, meaning that they tend to be from R&D intensive industries. And in terms of the impact which IMS always seeks in its work, we, uh, based on the, uh, on, on the uh, research that we do, we publish, we don't publish academic uh, reports, we publish business reading reports to reach out to the SME audience in Russia and internationally. And uh, it's also important for us to have an impact through, through the education because we are part of the business school. So based on the research, we develop courses, we develop teaching uh, cases, which are later used in proprietary executive education programs for SMEs in, uh, in Skolkova. Um, the new project, which I will be presenting today, it, uh, it, it continues, I would say, the series of, re of uh, research that started last year. Last year, we did the um, report selected 15 winning strategies of Russian entrepreneurial firms. And the objective of that uh, project was to uncover the stratum of Russian mid-sized companies to understand how they became successful, how they grew, how their trajectory looked like, and what are the challenges going forward. The work was done together with the uh, Global Academic Council uh, on Russia at World Economic Forum. And in fact, it was published uh, as a featured report, Unknown Russia powered by entrepreneurs and was successfully presented at the Davos Forum. Uh, report was widely discussed and uh, that encouraged us to continue working in this direction. Um, coming back to the topic of the, today's uh, presentation again, we believe that, uh, especially in Russia, uh, the context in which companies operate today, it has changed. The decade of growth has now shifted to probably a long period of stagnation. Russia's traditional focus on the West has now shifted to the East. Before, companies competed on products, their functionality. But today, as uh, consumers become more sophisticated, they require more elaborate solutions. In B2B markets, that means that companies which um, produce and manufacture produce uh, like devices, they also have to uh, be very good at services. In B2C markets, that means that uh, companies would go to elaborate branding or very sophisticated engagement of customers. Altogether, these tougher business conditions, growing competition, it all requires SMEs to reconsider their growth agenda and reconsider how they go about internationalization which altogether means sophistication of their strategies. When we talk about internationalization, it's not only expert that we mean. In fact, internationalization, it's 
the uh, very wide spectrum of different engagements that a company can do in a global marketplace. We call it seven degrees of freedom, so that's why you see the 7D. And the traditional way, like the stage model to internationalization, export-oriented model, it means that the company goes international to get access to new clients, new markets. But also internationalization can mean optimization of your production base, you be, being closer to the customer, you being closer to your suppliers. It can mean leveraging uh, global capital markets to finance your growth or using the global talent pool to, uh, to grow your business. It can also include alliances and coalitions through which you can empower yourself to have more market clout or uh, learn from each other. And can include also having stakeholders, international stakeholders, which would um, pump up, I would say, the reputation of your company in the global marketplace. China in focus. Uh, while the current research has China in focus indeed, we believe that Russia, Russian mid-sized companies, they can learn from developed economies as well. In fact, we have done some research on German Mittelstand. We have some other developed economies in our pipeline. Uh, among the emerging markets, we have China, Brazil, India in our uh, oversight. Uh, China is the first one, and uh, there are reasons for this. First of all, what I call signals in the background. Russia and China are similar to some extent because for a long time the economies were growing because of, for different reasons, but they were growing. But now as they have exhausted their traditional sources of growth, uh, China and Russia, they, both nations, they increasingly look at how they can develop their innovation agenda, how to drive value-added export, how to grow the role of SMEs in the economy, differentiate the economy. And of course, uh, we all watch the news, Russia and China are now big friends, and they have proclaimed commitment to foster cross-country collaboration and trade. So we believe that this research will be very relevant in the moment. Uh, this slide gives a kind of conceptualization of the, um, of the project. Uh, the first quadrant is what is completed, and I will share the insights of that stage. This is something to follow. Uh, in terms of the design, just a few things. The research is based on cases. It's not quantitative, it's cases, cases of companies. We will have 15 cases, out of which seven are Russian, seven are Chinese companies, and one joint venture. Uh, in terms of the selection criteria for companies, they more or less satisfy what I've uh, mentioned in the beginning. These are mid-sized companies um, by turnover. Uh, I have to say that Russian and Chinese mid-sized business is very different, uh, but more or less the range is from 100 million US dollars to 2 billion US dollars, though it's for Chinese companies. But most of companies actually fall into like the range of 100 million to 800 million. Um, they are private, they are not state-owned, they are not from resource-based industries. Um, the next stage will be interviewing with selected uh, companies. This is proven to be very challenging thing, especially for Chinese companies, very difficult to reach out, but we really need those insights to test our observations that we have made based on secondary resources only. And finally, the last stage will be the outreach. We always pay a lot of attention to this. For this project, we have already gained commitment from the leading forum in Asia. It's Boao Economic Forum that will take place in uh, um, in, uh, in March, I believe, uh, where we will present the findings of this research. We also will have a publication, and of course, based on this uh, research, we'll develop uh, teaching materials, uh, teaching cases, and we'll be giving lectures ourselves. Uh, current insights, so go into the um, project. Uh, starting the, like, w w when we look at SMEs in Russia and China, it's very important to acknowledge that these are very different uh, realities. If we look at China, in China SMEs, like there are over 50 million SMEs in China, they make up 60% of country's GDP, 70% of China's workforce uh, uh, is in SMEs, and they make 60% of Chinese export. In Russia, the number of SMEs like barely reaches the uh, uh, six, uh, 6 million. They 
make a quarter of the country's GDP, a third of, of Russia's workforce um, is in SMEs, but they barely reach 1% of Russian export, which means that there is a lot of growth potential, but also a lot of challenges that probably hide behind that number. Um, Russian and Chinese mid-sized companies also uh, leverage global resources differently. These are the results of the survey which we conducted earlier this year among the delegates to the Russian Chinese Forum in Beijing. Um, basically asking the delegates to evaluate their company along these dimensions, capital partners, regulators, staff, etc. To, in terms of its degree of globalization. The gray color um, is, uh, means that uh, these dimensions, like the company uh, is very locally focused, domestically focused. The darker blue means that it's uh, scattered globally. So you can see a lot of blue and dark blue for China, which means that Chinese companies are very sophisticated in terms of using global resources across many dimensions, like if you see capital is probably the, the only exception here. For Russian companies, yeah, they, are, they tend to be very domestically focused. The only, uh, I guess, the, 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 the only dimension which stands out is partners, but mostly it means suppliers because Russian companies, even though we, they, they produce at home and they produce, can produce very innovative stuff, they still source their products internationally. Uh, international sales also mean different things for Russian and Chinese companies. Among the same delegates, you can see like in China, more than 50% of them, or oh, sorry, more than uh, like around 30% of them have uh, make more than 50% of their sales in international markets. The same number among the delegates of Russia, you can see it's 8% and almost 40% of them don't have any sales outside of Russia, but they came to the forum, which means that they are interested. Uh, in terms of the expected so sources of growth for the next five years, what we observe for Chinese companies is that 46% of them expand, like, seek, uh, see their growth in expanding number of international markets. And they probably do it, expect to do it through diversification of products and businesses which would underpin this international strategy. For Russian companies, they hope, place their hopes on uh, introduction of uh, new products and businesses. Unlike the Chinese, they have a lot high expectations for domestic expansion, which means again this sort of inward outlook that they still have to have. But the good thing is that what, a quarter of them wants to expand, uh, almost a third of them want to expand internationally for the first time. So there is a trend, there is a need. And uh, finally moving to the strategies piece because the research is about strategies. We have um, identified three categories of uh, strategies that the companies tend to pursue as they go global. They are called global sales, which means that the company uh, most likely operates in a very niche, a specialized market, and uh, uh, most of its uh, it operations, its R&D, its staff, is concentrated in its domestic market, while its sales are very international. Another uh, group of companies, they exhibit, uh, they, their strategies is, uh, strategy is called global operations, which means that these companies, they first, the domestic market is their core market. And if they go internationally, it's one of the main reasons why they do this is to source new um, technologies, maybe to lower their production costs in order to become more successful on the domestic market. So their share of international operations is high, but their share of international sales is low. And finally, there are global companies which view the world as a marketplace and they align their business accordingly. Importantly, this picture is not, is not static. It's very dynamic and this funny uh, smiley looking thing in the middle means that there is an evolution. Companies which start here 
they eventually go here and they become a global company. And the same we observe going from this end to, to this side. This frame is best exhibited, I guess, through the cases which led us to, 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 to build this frame. And now we'll give you just a few examples. We will have like a Chinese and Russian example for which of the um, strategy categories. Global sales. I'll start with the Russian one. It's Atlantis Park. Atlantis Park is a Russian mid-sized company. It's one of the top three largest world producers of plastic casings. These are kind of outer plastic casings, like outer shell of your like sausage, when you buy a sausage in the store. So it's a very specialized product. And it probably has, like, correspondingly, it has a very narrow, I would say, growth potential within one market. And for such companies, in order to grow, international expansion is vital. This company was established in 1993 by six friends from different backgrounds. Here I write that at the time experimenting with uh, different small-scale businesses. There is actually a lot in this statement because if we look at, at the year, most of the companies, mid-sized companies, which we uh, study in our research, Russian companies, they, are, they were founded right after the breakup of the Soviet Union. And they were founded out of necessity. These people were not looking forward to being entrepreneurs. They had their jobs, but they lost them. And they, then there was this period of searching for new sources of income, playing with different configurations. A lot of these configurations were like buy and sell business. Some of them kind of stopped there, others continued into manufacturing. With this case, we see Six people experimenting with different businesses. In fact, they had construction, they had logistics. One of them was a scientist and developed these plastic casings. And within three years of operation, the team decided that that's where they will go. They focused and they started growing that business. Very um, soon into their development, they became num Russia's number one producer. and. Uh, as they have exhausted and as they exhausted growth opportunities in Russia, they started looking internationally. Their first focus was on so-called countries with sausage culture, Germany, France, Poland. Uh, and uh, now they make 60% of their uh, sales globally. Uh, and the moment these countries, well, this uh, company is very active in such markets, Latin America, Africa, and Middle East. In fact, they have started talking about localization of plant in Brazil. So this is the case of Atlantis Park. Tier Time. I for, tier Time is a Chinese uh, leading producer of desktop and industrial 3D printers. I forgot important 3D. So this is uh, China's emerging 3D technology. Unlike Russia and uh, its companies, which were founded uh, after the breakup of the Soviet Union, again, what we observe in China now is that many companies are actually established by people who aspire to, to become entrepreneurs. So in this case, we have this young graduate of mechanical engineering who started this company. Uh, first, he started with 3D printers, which didn't, with industrial 3D printers, which were not taken off. Later, as the um, technology was becoming more popularized, they moved to consider playing in the B2C segment. But 3D desktop printers, uh, they still cost a lot of money. It's around like $1,600. So for the Chinese market, it was still expensive. They started looking at international sales. US and Europe became their number one uh, target. Uh, where because 3D printers, desktop 3D printers, they are used by what's called hobbyists, people for hobby, or for, whether it's uh, craft or whether it's uh, small scale at home construction stuff, DIY, so called DIY culture. They became very successful. They sell through distributors in the US. They engage with local consumers. They have a blog, they have a community, a forum. So they are very uh, active. Also recently they received an investment from US-based Dover Group to develop and sell industrial printers. So you can see that they are evolving. So they are starting to use other, like play in other dimensions of international expansion. Going to the next slide, global operations. Just to remind global operations, when the company is domestic focused, domestic market is its main priority, and it goes international, 
to get some additional resources to become more competitive at home. Uh, we'll start with the Russian company, August, August, August. Uh, it's Russian major producer of plant protection chemicals, again started in 19, uh, seven, 1990 by an ex-chemical scientist who stopped doing research and uh, uh, went into business. The company is uh, very R&D intensive and in fact in Russia it's remarkable but it has become number one uh, company in a very competitive market where like other place they are very big like Bayer or BASF. Uh, because of its very niche and focused strategy it became a, a, an expert to its customer base because it understands like different varieties of crops, of soil, so it's a very nuanced offering that they make. Uh, in order to, but he, 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 at the same time, they're very dependent in the, for their products. They still need ingredients from international, from buyer. Let's say. And uh, who is a competitor, but at the same time as a supplier. To lessen the dependence on its supplier, the company went to establish a joint venture in China with a Chinese company to cut down on the cost of its uh, active substances, which were used in the final products. It... Uh, basically made the operations of the company more efficient and that's how the company the uh, August used again other opportunities outside of the uh, country to be more competitive in the domestic market. Sinacare. Sinacare is China's leading producer of rabbit trace blood glucose testers, um, glucometers they are called also. It was established recently, well recently in 2002 by a physician who then decided to be a medical researcher, researcher, who later switched from what he called a profession, professor dream to entrepreneurial dream. So we see a different pattern of entrepreneurship here. Um, here early on in his career, he uh, realized that diabetes will be really growing in China, unfortunately. Uh, but at the same time, the offerings which were available at them on the market, they were international, they were not in Chinese, they were not very useful, uh, ready to use. So he uh, came up with this solution which was, which cost, uh, which was at a lower price, which was uh, focused on the needs of local consumers, it was in Chinese and uh, kind of adapted to the local uh, market. Now he is trying to win highly lucrative market of selling to hospitals, as I understand in this industry, as in industries like medical industry, everyone is fighting for the big market of hospitals. And uh, at that time now they are trying to become more competitive in China by buying technologies elsewhere. So what do they do? Earlier this year, they bid it for buyers' diabetes device business. Unfortunately, they sold, well, they lost that bid to Panasonic. But they, just a month ago, I guess, they successfully acquired Nipro Diagnostics, a wholly owned US subsidiary of Japanese Nipro Corporation, which has a broad portfolio of uh, uh, glucose monitoring supplies and technologies. So they go internationally to become more technologically sophisticated and advanced. And um, global companies. Global companies, uh, some companies, they evolve to become global. Uh, here we have two examples, the Russian and the Chinese companies, which actually became global more or less from day one of their existence. I'll start with the Chinese one, Apple's. Apple's is China headquartered global, global mobile internet company specializing in Android application. What this application does, it um, basically helps, it's for Android phones, it helps users of uh, uh, primarily cheap Android phones to improve the performance of their phones by boosting their, I don't know, their time duration, their battery life, by expanding the memory space. Uh, so it's one of those uh, bottom innovation from the bottom, I guess, because it's uh, really for for the. Um, uh, for, the, for, for the users who cannot afford uh, good smartphones. The company was founded uh, a year ago, over a year. It has uh, covered over than 500 million users worldwide with 90% of its operation coming uh, outside of China. Uh, and the, the, the idea behind kind of the, the business itself was uh, 
that Chinese market is over competitive. So they wanted to have the product which would have uh, a, a good uh, uh, response globally. Uh, and uh, just recently, they also go into more sophisticated um, dimensions of internationalization, like partnering in India, like starting their own fund in India as well to back up local startups, maybe to source some new ideas for future products. Russian company Spirit, it's a world leader provider of voice and video engines. It started in 93, uh, almost the product was so good that uh, it's actually its first sales happened in Japan to a NAC corporation. It, it, the company struggled to penetrate the US market. It took it five years. Finally, it did sign a contract with Texas Instrumental. Then it went to work with almost all global um, technology leaders. Then later on, as 3D networks began to uh, spread, it also partnered with uh, small uh, smartphone producers. Uh, and actually, it's, this technology is in 60% uh, of smartphones worldwide. Unfortunately, now we see a bit of a challenge for the company because it has been losing its position to Google and Microsoft as they develop their own software solutions and now they're experimenting with new businesses. So we see that maybe Apple's actually this point here, the way that it sources new ideas would prevent from such a development uh, in, in the future. There are a few slides about the experience of Russian and Chinese joint venture, but I'm being shown that uh, we don't have time for this. I will just skip this um, and we'll quickly go to the preliminary observations for what we see now. There are three strategies which I outlined before, but I guess <coughs> Before them, we, we already noticed that the pattern of leadership, the nature of entrepreneurship in Russia and China, they are very different. The motivation to, uh, to become an, un an un entrepreneur is also different, and it would be very good to highlight this in this research. Also, in terms of the different strategies, we see global sales. For Russian companies, from what we observe, they offer highly specialized and technological products to go to be competitively um, able, I would say, in international markets. They pursue the so-called global niche strategy. Chinese mid-sized companies go playing in innovative um, industries, I would say. They expand to international markets with good enough offering. We saw the apples, we saw the 3D printers. So they conquer global mass market. For global operation strategy, Russian companies, they mostly aspire to cut down on production costs and minimize dependency on supply. Sometimes they also go out to look for technology. For, for Chinese companies, this is number one reason to go in international for mid-size companies, to go to become more sophisticated uh, in terms of the technology, business processes, and bring it back home because Chinese market is big, but it's very highly competitive. And finally, global companies, well, for Russian, uh, of course, for global companies, it's the mixture of the previous points, but also for Russian companies, what, what we hear, what we, what, what we observe again, is that they tend to diversify their business because they want to reduce country risks. Russia is still for them associated with very high country risks. And one of the underlying motivations to go outside is to reduce country risks. For Chinese companies, it's actually about local competition. From what we hear, uh, um, from Chinese companies in secondary uh, resource so sources is that the, for them to go global means to bypass local competition, but also to some extent all of them are talking about playing less on overall like China's stance of going global and the country expanding to the world. Uh, so these are the things which I wanted to share with you just for the next steps. Yeah, I, uh, since today we are discussing potential routes of collaboration. Uh, I wanted to, uh, I guess, reach out to you. Uh, we already talked to, uh, with Albert yesterday about um, maybe some ideas of how we can best approach Chinese companies and, and talk to them. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Yes. Uh, we can go over a little bit. There's, there's, there's a question. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for a really interesting presentation. I've been interviewing and surveying China's private entrepreneurs since the 90s, so um, we definitely oh. have a lot uh, in common. My main question concerns um, the sample of the survey that you administered, because I understand they're all delegates to this particular forum, and so it would be helpful to understand uh, the selection bias um, of who's participating because you've got Russian firms who clearly have tra traveled all the way from Russia to China versus Chinese firms that are already based in China. Um, are they all medium sized? Were they biased by particular sectors? Because that might help us understand the nature of the you know, particular biases that are coming out in, in your survey. Yeah, Thanks. the survey was, uh, if you uh, noticed, the um, sample size was only 90 people. Right. So it was this, um, I would say, just screening, like very uh, preliminary screening of what's going on. And indeed, the delegates to the forum, they were of different size. They were, uh, they, I don't uh, now have the percentages with me. A lot of them were from mid-size and medium-size companies, Chinese and Russian. There were 60 Russian companies and I think uh, 30 Chinese companies. So it was uh, also uh, skewed a bit. Uh, but. Uh, I would say that the results of that particular survey give us, they don't give us statistical significance, but they give us the direction in which to think, in which we can compare Russian companies and Chinese companies. Now we are planning a more mass scale survey of Chinese companies, Chinese exporters through our partner, uh, uh, but this is still kind of uh, to be done. <laughs> One thing that is also notably different between the Chinese companies and the Russian ones are the Chinese companies are all younger in yeah. age. And um, there's been research on Chinese uh, industrial productivity growth, which suggests a lot, all the action in China is coming from new, highly productive firms entering. Uh, and, and these types of firms uh, are unusually important in China compared to other countries, if you think about the size distribution or where growth comes from and where jobs come from. So those are also key, I think, sources of business, <laughs> um, but also insight, because those are driving the Chinese industrial sector. Mm -hmm. That's important to consider. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions to us? I just wanted to briefly mention, I have brought those reports which were in the presentation. I will leave them here. They are for you to, to take home or to, to uh, look through. Just one, just one final, really, I know we're out of time, but just one final quick question. I'm wondering about, I'm wondering, I'll just speak loudly. I'm wondering about the extent to which your survey includes questions about government business relations. No. Okay. No. That's too bad. South side. <laughs> it, it's difficult. People don't want to talk about their global strategies, glo government relations. It's, um, yeah, we would love to.